History is here to help here on Think Tech uh, and to help us understand the relationship between democracy and the media is Julian Gorbach, Associate Professor at the School of Journalism in UH Manoa. Welcome to the show, Julian. Hi. Glad to be back, Jay. Glad to be back. Glad to see you. So let's let's talk about it because this is, you know, this is really important going forward. And I don't know if people truly understand the relationship of democracy and the media and the First Amendment. Uh, can you talk about that from your vantage? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, one of the things about it is that uh, I like to, when I, when I teach students and I try to get them talking and, and to really genuinely understand it, um, I try to get them to just understand it on, a, on an everyday basic, a kind of a big picture level, like it, 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 these words are, are big words, democracy, the First Amendment, the media, um, but, but in our lives, they come into play all the time, and, and we have to have a real concrete understanding of them. So like, for example, when I teach just the 100 level course at, at UH um, on news literacy, one of the first things I do, well, the first thing I do really when, uh, when they come into the class at the beginning of the semester, is and and i mean this could be a little tricky I've, I've tried to set it up in different ways and i kind of have a strategy for it now that i i think may work but i kind of try and get the students to argue to debate or or like just to argue and i also ask them when i kind of set up that exercise to have at least one person in each group when i break them into groups be the observer of what is has happened and then once I've kind of run this exercise, we have a discussion about what just happened. And I ask them not who won, and you know, they think the exercise while it's going on is about whatever it is they're arguing about. I know that the that the that the exercise is about their arguing. And so when it when we kind of run the exercise and we talk about it, I say, what did you notice? Were you listening to each other? Were you presenting facts? Were you presenting evidence? I mean, in the, early in the semester, it, it's a difficult exercise to, to set up right because everybody comes in and they want to, if you just say, okay, everybody go talk to each other, let's do an exercise together. They're all meeting, how do you do? And where's the party tonight? It's the beginning of the semester, everybody's excited and friendly. Uh, but what I really want to get them to do is, is look at how well do we actually listen to each other and do we use facts and evidence when we talk? And then I ask them, you know, do you do that with your friends when you're, when you're, do you have a rational debate when you're deciding where you're going to go out at night or, or whenever any kind of conflict comes up among friends? Do you have a rational debate in your family? Do you have a rational debate when you get online on whatever platform you're using, whether it's Snapchat or, or TikTok or whatever? And um, they all kind of, shake their heads. I mean, to some degree, it, it often ends up very polite in the classroom, although there's ways I can, I can jigger things with the way we do the exercise to change that. But the overall point is I say, look, there's only 30 of you or 60 of you in the classroom right now, and you were supposed to come to this decision or this rational conclusion about this thing. How well does that go when we actually try and debate and argue and discuss or whatever? And I said, that's the concept of self-governance. That's the concept of, 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 of the democratic system at its heart, right? And um, really- well, Actually, I'm wondering about that, Julian. Um, you know, you can have an argument on everything. You can argue, you know, whatever turns you on at breakfast. But, but we have to have, a, we have 330 million people in this country. Right. And they have to have a common understanding about what brings them together as a country. Um, otherwise, it's chaos. And we have seen chaos emerging uh, during the Trump administration, uh, where people, you know, sort of got off that bandwagon. They no longer agree on what is important in the country. They no longer agree on what the Constitution, the rule of law mean. And so, um, yes, I agree. We have to argue about specific public policy issues. We have to keep um, keep current, keep updating ourselves on what's important, uh, you know, in our society. But 
but the fundamentals that bring us together, the mesh that connects our 330 million people. And I see that as democracy. I, I see well, that I mean, as the, the agreement to be together. But, but what is democracy, JJ? It's, it's us getting together. And if, I, if we can't do it with 30 students in a classroom who are all gregarious and happy to meet each other and, and wanting to talk about what's going on that night and, and friendly, if they can't have a rational discussion, a rational disagreement, how well does that work with 330 million people? And that's not even bringing in the, the factor of, of this communication being mediated through newspapers, through cable, through whatever. So just what I try to get them to understand is that this is the concept. We get a group of people together. The idea of government of the people is literally just that. It's nothing more fancy than that. It's that we are responsible for our own governance, right? And then you add in the distortions and, and, and all of the uh, things that happen once it gets mediated. And that gets, a lot of times that's amplifying the problems that we have innately with just having a disagreement with one another. You know, I, I just, what I'm asking students to say is how much do you naturally, take the media completely away from the picture for a second. How much do you naturally over, you know, interrupt each other, shout each other down, uh, not rely on the facts or ignore facts, you know, when they come in, have a disagreement about what the facts really are. Now, try that with 330 million people and try that with Snapchat and Facebook and, you know, all the social media platforms, all the cable news networks, all the algorithms. And, and, and that's, in a nutshell, you know, you'd ask me, what's democracy and what's the media? You know, the idea of the press in, in you know, Jefferson's time, ideally, was that it, it facilitated this conversation of self-government. And that's why he made that famous statement. You know, so many of these things become cliches that we forget what they mean, but, but that statement where he said, you know, would I have a government without um, the, the press or the press without government? I would, I would prefer the press without government. And I, and I think what, what Jefferson meant by that is if you have the press and the people, you essentially have a democracy because you have the heart of government. So they will work out the rest. But if you just have a government and you don't have a free press, you aren't going to have a democratic system. So it's not a system that he preferred. And, you know, what's happened is the technology has evolved. But, you know, if, if you even look at Jefferson's own life, you know, he had terrible relationships with the press. In, the, um, in one of the things that I look at in a, in a media history class is the era that we call the partisan press when things got incredibly vicious. I mean, it's, it's really a pretty close analogy to the you know, Fox News and MSNBC and CNN and, and Republican versus Democrat situation where we have now, where they were, they were just at each other's throats by you know, 1798, 1800. And I, I, I kind of don't, you know, I don't try and spoon, spoon feed a lot of times I have an idea of, of what I want to get across for any given period or whatever, some main points. Um, but I try not to spoon feed to that to the students. I sort of say, well, you know, where's the connection between this viciousness in 1798 and the inc incredible toxicity in our media today? And the answer is, in 1798, we weren't really used to the idea yet of having political parties. And so the idea that they're of the loyal opposition, the idea that there was this other political party and that they may disagree with you on all these fundamental principles of governance, but, but everybody agrees on you know, the, the, the constitution and the democratic system in the United States, that is what sustains civil discourse, this idea of the loyal opposition. And, and we didn't have that yet. In, because we were such a new country. Do we have it now? It, you know, then it hadn't really formed yet. Now it's fallen apart. And you know, we, have, we have the Republicans and the Democrats who are, are seeing each other as, as like the way you would talk about a foreign enemy. 
I mean, yeah. let me, but let me interrupt you. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it's this whole notion of balanced reporting where you give credit, as in your class, to what the other side feels. False equivalency, you come up. Yeah, but sometimes, you know, the other side is lying. Right. Or, or the, the other side is, his view is built on lying. I right. mean, Donald Trump lied 30,000 times uh, in the course of his administration. And, and his, his, right now, his whole view of the world is, and his view to his uh, followers is based on the big lie. Um, Vladimir Putin has state TV, and he lies to them all day long about, about Ukraine. It's built on lies. And so my question to you is, can you, should you, do you want to have this kind of, uh, yeah, I'll listen to you, um, when you know that one side is trying hard to tell the truth and the other side is trying hard to lie? No, I mean, and, and you know, I think one of the things we can talk about today is that, that this is in my first rodeo with you, Jay, where we get on and talk. And to a large degree, we, we, we dug into this in previous conversations about these kind of old notions of objectivity and the press being fair and impartial and unbiased and, you know, this both sidesism that goes on in the media. But, you know, let's pause for a second just to say that part of the nature of the problem right now is that. Um, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but if you're a Trump supporter and you believe Donald Trump and you hang on every word, I mean, we, we can debate what these people really think, okay? But, but, but there are certainly a lot of people who have listened to him and have bought this idea that the Democrats rigged the election, that they, you know, they would stop the steal, that they stole, that they, they buy into the big lie. And if you actually believe that, then you see the Democrats as like the enemy and like all bets are off for what you're willing to do. So I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying that, you know, when we look to history and, and, and our democracy in this country, there was a time right near the founding when the two sides saw each other as like the way we see foreign enemies. And we are back to that now. Now, as far as you know, what you're saying about, um, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're moving students, I mean, what, what is this called? Well, History of the I'm rest? talking about students, okay? I'm talking yeah. about your students. Yeah. Let's assume, and I'm sure you have this experience, one student in the class is, um, is on the GOP side and the other is, is on the, you know, Democratic side. Um, now, and you want them to have, to argue the points. You want them to reason together. Yeah. To come to sort of, I hate to use the word consensus, but some kind of agreed conclusion about the reality in terms of fact or policy. But, but one of them is lying or operating on the basis of lies. How can they come together if that is the case? Well, you know, that's an interesting aspect of this, right? When I said before, imagine the Trump supporter who believes Donald Trump. You know, I, I think one of the things that we have to take into account with this when we look at it is, you know, I was a reporter in the Deep South for a while. And there were times when I, you know, in, in Louisiana, there were times when I confronted people who had a real deep, genuine contempt for the press. And they saw themselves as patriotic Americans. And that was when it dawned on me that not everybody in this country who grows up seeing themselves as a patriot necessarily loves a free press or the idea of everybody having a right to vote or all the things that we associate when we wave a flag or when we pledge allegiance, whatever it is we do, with being a patriotic American. That there has always been a really retrograde, really scary uh, currents in the United States of people who have really no interest in democracy. Right. Now, in my classroom, you know, I, I'd have to say before we get to the speed bump of, of the students who are Republican and the students who are Democrats, they all come in and they say, the media is biased and we need an unbiased media. We need the media to be just the facts and stand there. They all say that when I give them online forums or when I just let them talk in the first week. And when you do do like now, not only am I teaching a news history, uh, news literacy class, but I'm teaching a history class. I say to myself, I introduce ideas like maybe that's not the most sophisticated way to think about the media, 
and what it should be doing right now. But I also hold my fire a little bit because I know that after we get to the partisan press, we're pretty soon going to get to the Civil War. And it's kind of once they start seeing the black newspapers and the northern, you know, abolitionist anti-slavery newspapers and the pro-slavery, you know, pro-secession newspapers. And the fact that, you know, if you were a Yankee reporter and you tried to go down south, you'd probably end up with a rope around your neck. That if you wanted to go report down in Mississippi or Alabama in, in the months leading up to the war, anytime during the war, you damn well better go undercover and send your dispatches through code. A good friend of mine has a whole chapter in his book on Civil War reporting about this. Um, and then they begin to get, oh, there isn't always both sides to everything. And then another thing that I say to them is, you know, we, we went through this last year with the, with the, um, with the, when the pandemic was going on and there was all the vaccine issues going on. And they all say, just the facts, just the facts. Kellyanne Conway said alternative facts. We don't believe in alternative facts. We want just the facts. And I hate to, to break this to everybody. I mean, I'm a good liberal, like a lot of people. Okay. But you know, when we talk about alternative facts, if let's let's take the, the vaccine for a sec. I, I said to them, how many of you, and they're all, you know, good kids at UH Manoa, they've all been vaccinated. I say, how many of you believe in the vaccines, believe the vaccines are safe? They all raise their hand. This is the kids often I have in a class. I say, how many of you have friends who are anti-vax? They all raise their hand. And I say, okay, let's go around the room. And I want each of you quickly to tell me what just the facts you're going to tell your friends about why they should take the vaccine. We go to six different people, seven different people, doesn't matter. Every single person has grabs a different group of facts and organizes it in a different way to say the fact is the vaccine is safe. They want to say the vaccine being safe is or ineffective is a fact, God damn it. But then how you interpret all the little facts, how you put it together, how you construct the argument. It, it can really vary. And some arguments are stronger than others. And so now on the other hand, when I go to the store, do I know my way home? Do I know that I was born? Do I know that I was going to die? Like some facts are just facts, right? But we live in a world also where, where you know, tons of data, tons of pieces of information that we have only have meaning when we drop them into a, a web of meaning. And so it's, you, you, there's no such thing as just the facts journalism. At a certain point, you know, what I, what I introduce students to early on is that if, in or, you have to understand this about the media. You're always going to have fact and forum, right? And fact is when it's just, just the straight news. We want, you know, there was a robbery, blah, blah, blah. Forum is all of the space, and we do, as you know, as older people who are so enmeshed in media, we're well aware of this, is the vast amount of space in our media system that is devoted to interpreting and debating those facts. And, you know, and, and of course, you're gonna say, you know, because I can see where you're coming from, this has completely fallen apart. That, you know, now you have the, the liberal media over here saying one thing, and and Fox News and OAN and all these others, and they just tune each other out and follow their own facts and forms. That's what we have. <clears throat> and um, you know, so you talk about facts about the, the vaccines. Well, it's been politicized, and uh, you know, it's understandable how a lot of people are confused, uh, uh, and it's it's too bad because it's a life and death issue. And um, this this um, you know, uh, Trump has gone a long way to engender and enhance that confusion. And, and that's, that's the way autocracies work. Don't you connect that? Do you, don't you feel that uh, in an autocracy, you create the facts yourself and you create them for your own interest? And it doesn't matter what the true facts are. So the more autocratic a government is, uh, the more likely people are going to be confused or completely misinformed. Well, it seems to me that, that a lot of the problem is that we, you know, we went through these painful stages of, of self-regulation of the media when it came to newspapers, right? In the 1920s, that's when we really, uh, 
the professionalization of journalism got to the point where by that by 1920 we had journalism schools you know we had the university of missouri where i got my phd was the first which established in 1908 and pulitzer school at columbia had been established and by 1920 we had a whole bunch of them right and we had the 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 guilds of you know the um the you know the association of american editors and 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 all of these established codes of conduct. And there were big debates. Could you decertify people? Just like the way doctors or lawyers can be, you know, stripped of their licenses to practice. Can you, and of course we can't do that because of the first amendment, but we also went through it with radio, right? We had to, there's only so much space on the radio dial. We had to figure out how to assign that in a fair, equitable way that was good for the public, right? And, and whether we arrived at the right things, we had to do it with movies, right? With the Hollywood code, which was an enormous fight through the thirties. And yet, like we're just such a myopic society that we act like we have no history. And when we get to the internet, which is a new technology, we act like we've never regulated the media before. And we have these incredible debates that we get mired in that are stupid that we can't seem to get out of. Like there's a difference between the government's restraint of first amendment which, which Elon Musk doesn't seem to understand, or at least he didn't in all of his first statements about, about Twitter, that the government has to be incredibly self-restrained by the First Amendment of just letting people say all kinds of things, right? But then companies have always mediated their content. And what, one of the things that I was, I mean, I, I'd imagine you saw the January 6th hearings, um, was that two days ago? Um, one of the things that I found most interesting it was just kind of a, a side thing, but you had that audio of the guy on Twitter talking about um, the back and forth that they were seeing. And I mean, everybody acts like these, these social media platforms are so massive and so impossible to control and monitor. And, you know, it just is a machine and, and it's an out of control machine. And what can we do? There's billions of people on Facebook. It was really clear to me from that thing that they are watching those messaging, you know, that messaging back and forth very closely. And we've certainly had social media in this political environment and these platforms long enough that these guys have a pretty clear idea. Maybe it's not like a newspaper or a cable channel or a Hollywood movie studio or a book publisher, but they are curating their content. They have say in what the character of their, if they want to be 8chan and they want to have Nazis parading around, it's like each of them has a park or a Starbucks cafe and they can make that as open and closed as they want. If you don't want people in, in full Nazi regalia walking into your Starbucks and hanging out at the counter, you can throw them out because you're Starbucks. You're not the American government. OK, which is restrained in what it does as well. It should be. And, you know, what Walter Ruttman said over 100 years ago was there may come to a point where people and I think maybe he's being a bit optimistic here because it, the people may break before we're able to correct the system. But he said where people in a fit of temper are going to demand action or he said, actually, when Congress in a fit of temper is going to come down on the media as an act. And the regulation of media is a, is a subtle and difficult enterprise and it has to be handled carefully. And we do not want it to get to the point where the government has to step in and regulate. Well, there's a really, this is a really important point, Julian. Yeah. You know, we have chaos. We have misinformation. We have disinformation, not only from sources in the country, but from sources out of the country trying to influence voters and public opinion in the country. Um, from an informational point of view, we have chaos, and it's getting worse. Um, and I, you know, I, I just wonder where the First Amendment is these days, and and where the media is these days. Given the chaos, everybody is uh, into his own thing, his own uh, self-interest, and his own. You know, let's get some advertising here. It's just remarkable to me that we we see all this news on television, and it's all terrible. I mean, and then, and then we see happy. Happy commercials, uh, or we see this news on television talking about a civil war, uh, and then we see a movie um, that's all about violence and vengeance, and it's really hard to draw the line. And I think uh, you know the FCC um, may not look at these issues, and the government may not look at these issues, but how do you fix the chaos? 
you know, doesn't it, the government have to step in in some way carefully within at least some mm, revised version of the First Amendment and, and, br and bring things into order somehow? You know, Jay, I, I mean, I think that, I guess the point I was trying to make a moment ago is that we, we can't forget that certain norms are still there. Like some of these major media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, the idea that, that, you know, that we live in this brave new world and they can't control the content that goes on there. I think we need to be seeing the end of that. That being said, that doesn't necessarily mean the opposite of true, that the, that the, the, the internet in some ways isn't in, uncontrollable and incredibly dangerous. And I don't have answers for some of this. Like one of the things that I find really disturbing about the July 4th hearing, and it's funny because uh, this is an idea that, that to a large extent, you and I were talking about three or four years ago when we talked about how politics is to a large extent psychological and often feeds into the, the very dark parts of not just the individual psyche, but the, but the dark parts of the collective psyche, something we saw with Nazism where you saw a society got mad. And there's really no political explanation for Nazism. It's a, it's a dark psych psychological one. But I would say with the, with the July 4th thing, what we you saw- You mean the was, January 6th thing? No, the July 4th massacre. What you saw from that kid's social media um, uh, postings is that psychopaths, people who are homicidal, get together and network now. That the, that the internet is not just a networking tool for people like you and me to have a Zoom chat, but for people, for people who are killers or are really bent can now seek each other out in a way that they couldn't before the internet existed. And I think a lot of the craziness that we're seeing online at all kinds of gradations, from people who are just a bit politically extreme, to people who are getting on there talking about large capacity magazines, and, and posting snuff films to each other is, is what we're reckoning with, with the networking, the incredible networking power of an internet. You know, what can the, uh, the, the, you know, the press, the media do? Uh, what can the government do? How are we gonna bring this back to some sort of arrangement which keeps the country safe, an arrangement which keeps the country mm, as a democracy? Because I think those are threat; those are threats right now. The country is not is not safe. Um, the government is broken, and thus the democracy is broken. Um, what can we do? And that includes you and me. It, it includes the media. It includes the government. I don't know, Jay. I mean, you know, I I, I don't have an answer on some sort of a programmatic theoretical way, except to underscore maybe what I was saying is that this is not our first rodeo with self-regulation, right? Um, this is, you know, there are ways that these, you know, that these, these, these huge tech platforms have to see themselves as media platforms. And we have to, I mean, a lot of the problem I have, and this is why I'm saying it's not theoretical, it's not programmatic, is we have to stop having stupid debates for hours and you know the, the the part of the press that is functioning needs to get a little better at looking at the facts and letting some oxygen in the room so it's not the five people that we're seeing on MSNBC all day every day like spend some more money and have some smarter people or some different people come in people like you and me that can come in with a different idea because like why are we still stuck in the confusion of the difference between first amendment restraints and the fact that these companies can do more. And that's just one example, okay? There are things about the abortion debate, about the gun debate, about Joe Biden's management and the arguments within the Democratic Party um, where there are just enormous blind spots and factual spots in that forum part. You know, I was saying fact and forum in the commentary part. And, and there's a lot of repetition of what they say over and over. And a lot of like kind of rubbernecking about, you know, stuff about Donald Trump. I mean, I, I was thinking yesterday with the, with the, um, the, the uh, January 6th hearings that we seem to be stuck in this, in this really scary state where if you guys remember the uh, 1984, you know, the end of 1984, where he says, how many fingers did I have up? And He's holding up four, but he wants the guy to say five, or maybe it's the other way around. But, but 
we seem to be stuck in a thing where the liberal media, the, the mainstream media, if you want to call it that, is saying, we still have four fingers up, right? Like we're, we're going, like the January 6th uh, hearings have introduced a tremendous amount of really important, fresh information. I don't know where the Justice Department is. I really don't. And I don't know where their communication is. I mean, and I think it's dangerous, okay? But having said that, we, the rest of us seem to be in this kind of pattern where a lot of the repetition is saying, these are four fingers, aren't they? We don't have five, do we? And we're and meanwhile, we're getting gaslit. And, and it's almost like you can feel the collective sanity, uh, the resistance of saying it's four fingers. This is four fingers is getting harder and harder to do. I mean, if, if you think about how much of the January 6th hearing of the last one was just devoted to trying to remind the public and reassure those of us who have been following every single hearing that four fingers is in fact four fingers, we're spending a lot of time on. And one of the reasons is that the actual democratic side, the Nancy Pelosi's, the Chuck Schumer's, the Joe Biden's, there's been failure there that we haven't addressed. You know, when you look at, I mean, I, and I don't, I know this is facile and it's over the top drama to, to talk about the Hitler era and the 30s and World War II. But, you know, I recently read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. I wrote a book uh, in World War II era stuff. The depth of the parallels and the reasons for the parallels between the 1930s and 2022 are terrifying. And a lot of that had to do with pushback from the pro-democratic forces that wasn't forceful enough to counter the kind of incredible aggression that Hitler brought to, you know, the incredible force that Hitler brought to bear. You know, Hitler just said, I mean, Trump said something interesting after the, the early primaries with the, the Republican field. He said to a, either a reporter or a colleague, they're weak. Marco Rubio, you know, uh, Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush, they're weak, and I'm going to break them. And I think that these people, especially Trump, you know, who kind of grew up with this sort of mobster type of tough New York scene, looks at Joe Biden and looks at that Democratic leadership and says, they are weak, and I am going to break them. And, and, you know, we could get into that. And, and look, I'm not on the left, okay? But we need to have a serious conversation. If you're, whether you're everything from a former Republican who's become a never Trumper to, you know, just mainstream. I mean, I just voted for the mainstream Democratic going all the way back to when I started being able to vote. I never was on the left side of, of whatever. I always was a mainstream Democrat. And we both, but for those of us who are there, Many of us, and you can see it in the polling about Biden, are incredibly frustrated by the way they're managing it. And yet, when I turn on my MSNBC, you know, to a lesser extent, I mean, I think the, the, the papers, the Washington Post have been, the New York Times, have been a bit better. But we are not, as a Democratic Party or as a non-Trump part of the party, we are not doing what we need to do to figure our stuff out. Okay, we'll have to leave it there, Julia. Yeah, that's a whole you, make some, you make some really powerful points, and I would like to continue this conversation with you. I'd also like to place it against the backdrop of the most important story of our lifetimes, which you told me about um, last time we talked, which is climate change. Uh, and the irony is that here we are talking about things that really um, don't hold a candle to climate, climate change in terms of an existential threat. Um, so, uh, Julian, it's so nice to talk to you. We'll do it again. Um, we'll set it up again. Thank you very much today. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo.
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.